Entrepreneur on Fire, episode 75. Welcome to EntrepreneurOnFire.com, where remarkable entrepreneurs share their inspiring story. Let their journey illuminate your path to success. And now, your host, John Dumas. First things first, Fire Nation. We're going to give it up for today's sponsor, Steve Olsher author of the award-winning book, Internet Profits. The world's leading experts reveal how to profit online, featuring sudden revealed, detailed online marketing strategies from Armand Morin, Mike Philsame, Yannick Silver, and 22 other world-renowned experts. For a limited time, you can grab a 100% free copy at internetprofits.com slash free. Again, that's Internet Profits, P R O P H E T S dot com slash free. Okay, Fire Nation, let's get started. I am simply thrilled to introduce my guest today, Barbara Corcoran. Barbara, are you prepared to ignite? I'm not only prepared to ignite, John, I'm sitting here looking at the photo of you and I'm prepared to ignite with you, brother. You're good looking. (laughs) Oh man, I love that. That's my favorite yet. Okay. (laughs) Barbara's credentials include straight D's in high school and college and 20 jobs by the time she turned 23. It was her next job that would make her one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the country when she took a thousand dollar loan to start the Corcoran Group. She parlayed that loan into a $5 billion real estate business, which she sold in 2001 for $66 million. I've given Fire Nation a little overview, Barbara, but take a minute. Tell us about yourself. We want to get to know you personally. And then tell us about your business and what you have going on right now. Well, I got that very lucky break that started me on the road to riches, so to speak, although they were, didn't come so quickly, I must say. But I did get a $1,000 loan from a boyfriend. I know you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> But I did, and uh, I met him while waitressing at the Fort Lee Diner, and when he walked in, it was like head over heels in love with this guy. I was crazy about him, but he gave me the $1,000 to start the business. That was my 23rd job. I had done everything else. I think I worked since the time I was 11, and uh, that was just a lucky break because he said, you know, you have a great personality. You'd be great in real estate sales, and I said, why not? I've tried everything else, and that's how I actually started in the real estate business, just a, a wacky situation like that. Man, that is just a great start to any entrepreneurial journey. And Barbara, before we delve more into that, and we're definitely going to, we like to start every show off Entrepreneur on Fire with a success quote. It gets that motivational ball rolling. And Okay. You already did it in the intro, but I know you have a success quote for us, and I'd love to hear it. Well, it's one that gets me going. I'm not sure it's good for everybody else, but it's good for me when I get at those points along the way, which still happens. I'm annoyed to admit that, where I feel stuck. I'm not quite sure what my objectives are. I'm not sure if I want to make that phone call. I'm not sure. And usually what's in my way is my perfectionism. I just want to get it right. So the best thing I read, it's not my quote, but I use it all the time for myself, is you don't have to get it right. You just have to get it going. Oh. And why I like that is it really moves you off the box and like, okay, okay, let me just pick up the phone and get it going. And that's usually the hardest part. After that, it takes on a life of its own, as you know. That is so true. It is such the hardest part. Get that snowball rolling down the hill and you will be just amazed at the steam that you pick up and so quickly. So Barbara, we'd like to take this down to the ground level because this is about you. You're our spotlighted entrepreneur today. So share with us how you've actually applied this quote or this mentality to your life at some point. Well, when I sold my Corcoran Group company for $66 million, you would think I would, should have been the happiest gal in town, and I was for about a week, particularly the day after the closing when I was just wondering, I wonder where all that money went. I <laughs> signed a lot of papers, but what happens to that money? And when I went to get my usual $200 out of my Citibank cash machine in my neighborhood, I heard that chi-chi-chi-chi, you know, that you hear every time, and yeah. out came my $200 for the week that I always got, but... I also got the little receipt that they shoot out, and in that, on that receipt was my first payment, $46 million sitting in my checking account. Boy, was that a thrill. That was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, I got caught up in that story. What the heck was your question? I think I got off track here. 
How do you apply that success oh, yeah. quote? Whoa, I, mean, I sound like a politician not answering the question, right? <laughs> you are so hysterical. Why, why I got into that stupid story is because I had to reinvent myself and figure, okay, once I realized I had to have a business, I was an entrepreneur, I was a workaholic, I loved what I did, and now I just sold the damn thing. What was I thinking? Even though I had the money in the bank, it seemed, somehow didn't replace all the things that the business brought to me personally. So I thought I've got to start myself all over again. And I decided I'd go into the TV world as a TV talent and be an expert on real estate, which seems like an easy thing. I knew a bit more about it than most people out there. I had great notoriety, but you know what? No one returned my phone calls. I found out that my old Rolodex was only good for the real estate brokerage business. Sure didn't help me in the TV business. Once in a while, someone would agree to meet with me. I'd pitch them my ideas, what I want to do for their network, their station, the kind of segments I had in mind. And they would yes, yes, yes me. And then they'd of course ask me, what do you think my apartment's worth? And that's really why they invited me in. <laughs> so it got very, very discouraging. And for someone who had worked so hard to create such a clear success, I mean, I couldn't argue with my own success. I found I was feeling depressed and had a very hard time picking up the phone, getting ready, ready for a presentation, asking for the job. I found it mortifying, frankly. And then I realized I just wanted to have everything right. So that I think was the first time I started practicing that quote, like, just pick up the phone and do something. You don't have to get it right. And I do that still every day. I had a rough week last week with a number of the entrepreneurs that I've invested in were going through rough patches. This was going wrong. That was going wrong. I really want to avoid it. But I decided to make a list of the projects, the problems right next to them, who the problem was, and just one, bang, 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 right after the other, I just picked up the phone, not knowing the solutions. But you know what's wonderful about life? You go through a door, you jump out the window, you pick up the phone, and once you're in the throw of it all, you're much more resourceful than you think you are. You always think better on your feet than sitting and observing and analyzing things. And so I think that freeing up to just push and make the first baby step, that's all you got to do, make the first baby step, and then all the complicated stuff works out somehow because you have the courage to just go through without the answers in your hip pocket in the first place. I know that didn't come out as clear as I wanted, but that's kind of what I mean by it. I don't know, Barbara, that was an amazing answer. And it just makes me think of one of my idols, who's Brian Tracy. And his quote was, swallow the frog first. Ugh. Isn't that a true quote? Isn't it a true quote? You betcha. It's not in marriage. You want to avoid that as quick as you can, right? <laughs> Well I, well, I have to say to you, I don't totally agree with the other guy because of this reason. I'm not, I need a little treat, a little sweetener. So if I've got a list of, say, 15 things on my to-do list, I always do something different. I go through the whole list and rate them A, Bs, and Cs based on which ones are likely to produce the biggest effect on my business. So the As are obviously the ones that have the, uh, the, the biggest net net on it, okay, if you attend to those first. But let me tell you, I will often sit down and do two Cs right up on the front side which are writing two lovely thank you notes to two people because they were so sweet and I really love them and I love my handwriting I love my note paper and I'll mail them out put the stamp on I'm just kind of warming up to the attack and then I'll attack the A's <laughs> that I don't want to do that, that was a perfect insight Barbara thank you for clarifying that that's just going to be such valuable information for entrepreneurs that you're right don't want to swallow that frog first thing maybe they want to do something kind of fun at first kind of get that ball up, rolling you know? okay. warm up get a couple swings in and that's a perfect lead in to our next topic Barbara and that is failure or challenges or obstacles oh that I'm good at You've, you're at the expert here on failure I'm really good at that one well <laughs> you and every entrepreneur Barbara because entrepreneurs part of our journey is failure and if we're not failing on some levels, we're really not being honest with ourselves as entrepreneurs. We're not pushing the envelope. We're not stretching our limits. So we need to be failing and making mistakes. I would walk a mile to avoid a failure and embarrassment, but they come anyway. They come and find you. Have you learned from your mistakes, from your failures, Barbara? And if so, pick out one that would really be a valuable lesson to the Fire Nation. Oh, I could, I could give you a thousand. You know, every single great thing that happened to me, building my career, was immediately on the heels of a terrible, embarrassing failure. Every single time. Now, I don't know if God had it out for me and just wanted to give me a hard time, but I never got a big whopping success unless I had gone through some trial of hell, some, one way or the other. So let me give you a few examples. One, I was... Uh, I had a great idea. I mean, you would agree with me at the time. Everybody thought it was a great idea. I was taking all of the apartments and homes we had for sale in New York City and putting them on videotape. Now, this was, remember, before there was such a thing as the internet. 
Right. Okay, so the way you usually saw properties, you find a little spot ad in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, call the broker, make the appointment, go over and see it. So I was jumping way ahead of everybody, sent video cameras, spent my $77,000 profit, first year I ever had a profit, blew it on my homes on tape, get it, H-O-T for hot. I thought <laughs> it was the coolest thing. Got them all on videotape, had my salespeople, had a professional makeup person come in, had their hair done, they posed for the pictures with their phone numbers, that wasn't being done yet, they looked beautiful. Beautiful, got the homes on tape, announced at a sales meeting, said, now we're bringing the homes to your customers. They could sit and watch, you know, pick out an apartment in their lazy boy chair. People thought I was a genius, okay? Well, of course, no one handed out the tapes. And you know why? I didn't think of this. Now, nah, easy to have hindsight because my agents didn't want to give out all these apartments when their customer that they had control of could see the next agent and how pretty she looked and maybe want to go out with her instead. So they sabotaged my efforts, unintentionally, but by doing nothing. And so my hot homes on tape was a dismal failure. All right. Now, I'm sorry to take such a long wind on this one. I'm sorry. But there is a story here. Okay. All right. So I'm getting ready for my big sales meeting. I have to admit this failure. No way. I'm thinking, how do I cover it? I'm too embarrassed to admit I failed here. And by coincidence, I have dinner with my husband, who was a weekend Navy captain, and he had just been in South Korea declaring war in North Korea on these computers. They played these stupid war games because they're all boys and they like to play games where they bomb people and stuff. Oh, yeah. So uh, he was over in South Korea bombing, bombing. He came home so wired up over this one. He goes, it was amazing. He tells me the whole same story here every year. I'm like, Bill, it sounds exactly like the same old thing you do every year. Why are you so excited? He said, we did it in real time. We were doing it in real time. I said, what do you mean real time? He goes, yeah, this new thing called the internet. Bang. Wow. This internet. So I listened to what it was. You know, the government had it first, obviously. And I heard what it was. I registered Corcoran Group URL that next morning. We had the sales meeting a week hence. I announced we were now taking all of these listings into cyber state, cyberspace. I didn't even know what that word meant, and I still can't say it, as you can hear. <laughs> but we shot it out to the salespeople as though it was part of the plan. Everybody thought I was a genius all over again. I wasn't a genius. I was just covering up for my mistake. I never thought I would do anything with this thing called the Internet. It was just just the way I was covering up for it. And you know what? We had two sales out of London within that week. Bang, bang. Well, all I did was throw all my units that I had on the stupid homes on tape onto the internet. And then I registered all the URLs of my competitors in New York City. And they had to call me and ask me for them back when they finally woke up wow. to this best thing that was going to ever happen to the world of real estate called the internet, which totally changed the way property is sold today, as you well know. But that would have never happened if I wasn't trying to cover up an embarrassment. It just, it just wouldn't happen. And every single good, great thing that pushed my business ahead happened on the heels of fail, failure. I never had an easy way to it somehow. I'm, I'm still annoyed with it, honestly. I want a few easy strokes here. So, Barbara, what year was that specifically? Uh, that was, I guess, uh, don't ask me for specifics on numbers. I'm terrible. I would guess 72, 73, maybe? You were me on a live then, my friend. Almost, but not quite. Your, your birth was announced on the internet. <laughs> I was lucky and I was industrious enough to try to cover up my pain. And that's the truth. I was just trying to plow forward. I had no idea that that was going to be the best thing. Do you know what an advantage it was to me to be able to try chat rooms first, take them up, put them down, put photos up, virtual tours that really didn't work then, try everything. You know, it's such a forgiving medium. You throw it up on the wall, see if it sticks, take it down if it doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything, you know? So it, no, I was lucky and persistent and you can give it to me on that, but that was not smart. Smart wasn't part of it. See, I love that phrase, see if it sticks. What is the major lesson that you really pulled out of that failure, of that time when you were just really trying to cover up what you viewed as a mistake? That there's great power in moving forward. You know, um, there's great power in moving forward whether you're moving in the right direction or not. You know, at least you're moving forward. You know, the sense of making the right calls in business, which is really great to do, you know, hire the right people, uh, put your right priorities front and forward, uh, what not to do, what to leave behind. Uh, all these judgment calls are key to building a business, as you know. You have to be fairly savvy and make decent judgments. But I think um, I think it's so much more important to just make a judgment and move on with it. You know, and my God, believe me, I've made so many misjudgments. But you know what's great about being labeled a winner once you have a little success under your belt? Nobody's counting your failures. Everybody's already labeled you a winner, and they they really assume you're going to succeed again. 
It's the weirdest thing. It's like you get to cheat your way to the top because you've already gotten the label as a winner. I know when I was building the Corcoran Group, I started four related real estate companies relative to my brokerage firm. I succeeded in one out of the four. And you know, nobody, the money spent, the effort put in, the announcements, the PR, nobody remembers the failures. They remember the winning. Oh, that's the gal. Oh, she made $66 million and built the biggest residential firm in New York. That's all they remember. And that's that. That's Barbara Corcoran. Mark Cuban loves to say, you only have to be right once. What do you think about that? Well, if it's only going to be once, you better make sure it's a big one. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. I guess, you know, if you create one great business, that's really all you need. Yeah. That, all right. I would have to know what he meant by that. But yeah, that makes sense. I'm with him. Besides which, I have to live with the guy, so I'm going to agree with him. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> so, Barbara, you had a great tie-in with your failure to what your success quote was, and just, just to start, just to get moving, and I love that. And let's use that to lead in to our next segment, to our next topic, which is the aha moment, that light bulb. You've already shared with us a light bulb that went off in your head with the internet when your husband came home from Korea and you just saw what he was doing. But as entrepreneurs, and especially with your journey, which has been just a great one, You've had so many aha moments and light bulbs that have gone off. Can you share with Fire Nation one or two aha moments, just light bulbs went off, and how you turned those moments into success? Yeah, yeah. I'll give you uh, one that made the largest difference, bar none. Wonderful. In the building of my business, the branding of my business. And, you know, if you could build a big brand, the business takes care of itself, I've always learned, you know? You almost have to run like hell to catch up with the big brand you put out there, you know? It puts pressure <laughs> on you. But... um I remember sitting around uh, ready to take a gun and shoot one of my sales agents. I think I had 14 agents at the time or somewhere there. And uh, they were coming into my office one after the other and whining and complaining as only great agents could do. You know, salespeople are not so easy to manage. They're a pain in the ass, frankly. Oh, yeah. But they're a pain in the ass. And that also gives them their tremendous success as a salesperson. So they're hard to live with. But they're great to the outside. <laughs> Two personalities. <laughs> so I had the inside personality with one person after another whining. Whine, nah, nah. What were they whining about? They were whining because I wasn't advertising for them. Of course, I knew I wasn't advertising for them because I had no money. You know, I would have advertised if I had the money, but it was a terrible real estate market. Interest rates, I think, were at 18%. Wow. Nobody was really buying, and I didn't have the money. So I'm thinking about maybe just like scrounging out some money and buying a gun at the local place and killing them all because that's <laughs> where I was, right? But instead, I'm still sitting around thinking, okay, what else could I do? What else could I do? And I decided to take the 11 sales we had had for the year. We had a total of 11 sales for the 12 month period among that many agents, not a good sign. And I added them all up and I divided by 11 and I decided I would write a little report and it would be about what apartments were selling for it. It was so bad because prices were tumbling like crazy. So I typed on my little selector typewriter, the Corcoran report, and I put average New York City apartment price and it was, I think, 54000 and change at that time. And I typed it in and then I made like 60 copies and I folded it and I mailed it out to everyone who wrote for the New York Times that day. You know, writers always put their bylines under the caption in the paper so it's easy to get a reporter's name. Right. All right, still today. So I just mailed it on out, okay, thinking, well, maybe some of them will write about my little report and then maybe a customer will read it at home has an apartment to sell, looking for an apartment and call us. It was just a stretch, I know. But I had no other option, so that's what I did. Well, do you know, no one ever called me, sadly. Uh, no one ever... Uh, I, I felt even received the report. I got nothing for it. But two weeks hence, I open up. I'm at home on a Sunday morning. I open up the New York Times and the front page of the real estate section. By coincidence, the title reads, New York City prices hit all-time low. And I'm like, oh, that's true. And I'm feeling a little sorry for myself, like, God. And then I read the reporter Carter Horsley, familiar name, and the first line of the article said, according to Barbara Corcoran, the president of the Corcoran Group, New York City prices have hit an all-time low of 54400 I I couldn't believe my eyes. It was like <laughs> a miracle. You know, I was raised Catholic. My mom would have called that a Catholic miracle. Those right. are the only kind. All right. So, bang. I like couldn't believe it. But you want to know something? That was my aha moment. Because when I went to the office that afternoon and calls, typical calls that brokers make to get listings. Would you like to give us your property? That kind of thing. For the first time in my life, I heard one of our salespeople say to whoever was on the other end of the phone, oh, you've heard of us? He didn't have to spell our name. and Literally did not have to spell Corcoran, which is a hard name to spell. It was either C-O-R, C-O-R. Oh, no, again, C-O-R, C-O-R. It was always confusion, but someone got it, and I heard him say, oh, you've heard of us. 
awestruck was this salesman, John Beckman. <laughs> and I realized that I had a new partner, and it was called the New York Times. And I started churning out so many reports, anything I could think of. When I churned out the Madonna report, when she got pregnant, she was the Lady Gaga of that moment. I didn't get Madonna as a client, which would have been nice. But I got Richard Gere, because his agent called me, because I was in the press being the expert on Madonna, even though I had no idea what she was looking for. But anybody could have written that report. She was rich. She needed views. She needed security. She needed more space. She was having a baby, right? It was just conjecture. But I churned out one report after another for the rest of my life. And the reason I was paid $66 million for my business was because $44 million of it was in the brand. 22 was on production. If they had paid for my business based on how we were producing, it was I was really entitled to a third of what I was paid, but I was paid that hefty sum because I had discovered the magic of producing a statistical report and churning it out day in and day out to the press and stealing the limelight from my competitors, which built my brand. And that's how I did it. So that was beyond an aha moment. That was like having God himself come down and bless me. Such a powerful aha moment. And how you just use that to turn to success is just inspiring, Over Barbara. and over again, the press never needs a story idea. What they need are statistics. So if you could, whatever industry you're in, be the, the churner of statistics, a simple one page, like if you make buttons, okay, how? what's the biggest button in the world? What's the smallest button? What color do kids like best in buttons? I'd bring in a focus group of five kids, have them pick out buttons. I'd make that an analytical report if I was in the button industry. I mean, I'm naming something stupid, of course, but no matter what industry you're in, what seems boring to you, if turned into statistics, makes you an expert and gives you notoriety. And that's the name, name and game changer of building a brand. No, it totally proves a point. It's extremely valuable advice. Barbara, have you had an I've made it moment? Oh, yeah. Yeah, not like clearly, but I remember, yeah, along the way you have these moments where you go, oh my God, oh my God, I might be doing it. Now, sometimes it's as clear as selling your business, okay? It's it's a perfect report card. You got the money in the bank. But no, probably the best uh, happy, happy aha moment, if you want, or whatever you just called it was. I made it. Okay, I've made it. Yeah, it was one year. I couldn't believe it. I had uh, over $60,000 um, in profits in one year, which was a lot. The business was medium sized. And I didn't expect it. You know, I always spent the money about a mile before it even landed on my desk. I, was, I already had it spent. But um, when I realized I had this windfall, I immediately went and got my mother and father a brand new car. They had never had a new car. My mother had only been licensed for three or four years, but she had an old clunker in Florida. My dad had an old clunker. He had always envied and wanted to have a Lincoln Continental. So I had my uncle pick them out in Florida, uh, they were their favorite colors, and they were driven up and given to them. And you want to know something? To this day, that is still the most satisfying, happiest thing that ever happened to me in my life. Because you could actually have the power to do something like that because you made the money in your business fair and square. And then you could actually pay somebody back, you know? Oh, that is an amazing I've made a moment, Barbara. Thank you for sharing that with us. But the car's old now. You can't sell it for anything but scrap metal, sad enough. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> Those cars are long gone. They had many others after that, but they were more easily affordable for me by then. <laughs> Barbara, you have so many exciting things going on in your world right now. Can you just pull out one or two things that are just really exciting you right now and what you're doing with your business? Well, the things that excite me most are when I have an entrepreneur who's hot to trot and burning up the turf and there's tremendous potential in the business. What happened, you're talking about like today, pull something out. Well, this morning I had a very great Skype call with two new entrepreneurs, well, new by four months, that's kind of new, yeah. okay, my new partners. Uh, they own Cousins Maine Lobster. And why it was so exciting is because you got two entrepreneurs equally talented, but with talents in different arenas. Always a great combination for any entrepreneur. You got a partner with opposite talents to you. Woo, that's like a dream come true. But anyway, they're opening up the distribution business. They had some quality control issues. We actually thought of a solution. We thought of marketing solutions to the packaging. We got so much done in one hour. They have their food trucks in California that they're making, believe it or not, $25,000 a month in profit on a food truck truck selling lobster. And so we're building a franchise model that they could knock out and make a really giant business. And they have that down pat. Okay. So it was like one of those calls where within a two hour window, you thought the world was possible and the people 
who were holding the potential for the world being possible had the talent to make it happen. I mean, it was such a high. I feel like I, I should have really taken the rest of the day off to tell you the truth and just feel <laughs> good about the world. But I couldn't because I had a lot of other stuff. Some of those other things. So what did that guy say? The turtles? What, the, what did that other guy say? The ones you don't want to do? I had a few of those that I had to take care of. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But there's nothing more contagious than um, rubbing shoulders with someone who's dreaming but also has the will capacity and the ability to jump over problems to actually get get there, you know, and really make their dream come true. Being around people like that makes you smarter, makes your energy high, makes you feel satisfied, makes you think all of life's a bowl of cherries, which of course it isn't. But it's the happiest slice of the pie, you know. And so those days when I'm working with my entrepreneurs that are really winning and have that kind of talent, let me tell you, I'd like it to be, you know, 8, 12 hours a day. It's usually a half of my day and the rest are stupid problems I deal with. So that's that. I don't know if I answered your question. You answered it perfectly. And I couldn't be happier with the actual topic that you chose because... Barbara, I'm a Mainer, and these guys are from Maine. They're Maine oh, bred. Oh, you cheater. You should have come clean on that in the first place. <laughs> I, you know, I had no idea where you were going with that, and I just love the fact that you chose some homebred Mainers that are making it happen out in California, and it's just the entrepreneurial and, spirit. Let me tell you, we were, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're pretty, I, I just have to tell you before I forget, we were at the governor's mansion in Maine. I'm sure you've seen that if oh, you're yeah. a Mainer, and his lovely wife, Anne, gave us a giant award for creating jobs in the state, so they're doing good creating jobs in Maine burn enough to turf in California and there's nothing to stop them. It's like no matter where you look at that business, it's doing good and the lobsters are great and the lobster rolls and the lobster pies and people are ordering them like crazy. So yeah, so it's a it's a thing where everybody's winning, you know? What whew, I wish all of life could be that way. You well, know? believe me, I'm tracking these guys because they are locals. They're right you here. You should interview these guys. These are these guys, whew, you'll fall in love with them. Don't take up too much of their time, please. I won't. Let's just do a quick 25-minute call. I'm going to get them on the line, and we okay. will have a great interview with them, I promise. We're going to get their Good. message out to the world. But promise it to the, your, your listeners because, uh, you know, they had, they're in that delicious position of being a brand-new business, and their memories are raw, and they're straight shooters. They're straight talkers. You'll learn a lot from them. Awesome. I am looking forward to it. So Barbara, before we launch into the last segment of the show, which is the lightning round, I just want to ask for my listeners, because they are all such Shark Tank fans. I mean, they crowd around their televisions 8 p.m. every single Friday night. They refuse to go out. They are just eyes glued to the television. Can you just tell us something about Shark Tank that you think that fans might find really interesting or really yeah. appealing? Yeah, I'll tell you what, which you don't see at home and you should be aware it happens. When they send uh, the, the, the production staff, sends the entrepreneur into the tank walking through that shark tunnel, uh, they always give them the same marching orders. You know, they're wired, they have the... You know, they have earpieces in so they could hear everything. Okay. Uh, but anyway, they're standing there, and that's a lonely spot to sit in. But right before they enter, they say, um, you know, don't start your pitch until one of the sharks talks to you. And, you know, they are pumped. They've been practicing their pitch. They really want to do a good job. They're like right. at the gate ready to burst out. So they run through that tank. You know, they always have a cocky look. They're looking <laughs> you straight in the eye, and they're feeling really good about themselves. They're dying to pitch. And then nobody talks to them for a full five minutes. Five minutes? It's five minutes. Now at home, what you see is you see them walk into the tank and someone asks a question. Right away. Yeah. But what I see is I see somebody who's terrible under pressure or someone who's great under pressure. And what a great test that is. Do you know, before they even open their mouth, I know who I'm out on. I just have to come up with a reason why I can say on camera, I'm out because, okay. But the truth is I know when I'm out right away because the guy takes his hand out of his pocket then he's shifting, he's no longer making eye contact, his eyes are going cross, he's sweating the bullets, his knees are joggling. I mean, this is the guy I'm going to give my money to who's going to make it to the finish line. I don't think so. All right, so that is like a dirty, nasty trick, but it works like a dream. And you know what it does for the production staff? It lets them have these giant cameras. You know, they have these giant cameras that are like this, the size of an elephant that come within inches of the face to try to record the sweat beads on the face. You know, they're, they're making TV after all. So it's a lot of pressure for those poor entrepreneurs. And no wonder when they start talking, sometimes they don't have a voice right away or it takes them a while to get their ego back up. You know, but it's a great, a great trick, mean, but it works really well. Barbara, that is so fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That is just something that people are going to take to the bank. It's going to change their way that they watch Shark Tank from this point forward. You're and going to feel sorry for every entrepreneur. That's what Every single do. one. <laughs> and you know, every pitch you hear at home, we're usually listening to the pitch for 45 minutes to an hour and a half. 
which is, of course, uh, slimmed down to, what, five to eight minutes, I yeah. think. Don't go on Shark Tank. <laughs> <laughs> so, Barbara, I want to be incredibly respectful of your time because you're being so generous with Fire Nation. So we're going to move in, unfortunately, to the last segment. It breaks my heart because I love talking to you more than life itself. We're going to enter the lightning round. and this You're is quite a schmoozer, John. Go ahead. <laughs> I've never heard that before. <laughs> oh, come on. I'm sure it's your middle name. Go ahead. <laughs> so we're going to enter the lightning round, Barbara. And this is where I get to ask you a series of questions. You can come back at us, Fire Nation, with amazing and mind-blowing answers. Does that sound like a plan? Okay. I don't know if I have the mind-blowing answers. <laughs> you have so far. Okay. What was holding you back from becoming an entrepreneur? Uh, nothing at all, I have to say. You know, my dad was fired every six months from his job as a printing press foreman and he had 10 kids to feed. I mean, he'd come home from work early. We knew he was fired. And he was like our John Wayne. We'd say, hey, dad, were you fired? You tell us all the story. We loved it. But my mother didn't. She had to feed the kids, right? So we were raised by a guy who should have been an entrepreneur. Absolutely. He was arrogant, talented, but arrogant and had to feed 10 kids. So that was an option. But you know, everyone in my family grew up to be an entrepreneur. Every single one of us started our own business. I think because he was a perfect walking, talking example of insubordination, you know, and you know, what's great about coming from a poor family where you're not trying to please your parents. You have no pressure. You don't even have to go to college if you don't want to, whatever, you know, anything goes, you have no pressure. You have nothing to lose and nowhere to go, but up. Do you know how freeing that is? It's much harder for somebody with money or a middle-class background or comfort life to become an entrepreneur than a poor kid because you throw everything to the wind you have nothing to begin with you're happy when you were poor so if you're poor again what's the big deal you know so so no I, I can't say I was ever held back from being an entrepreneur because I had lived a life that kind of pointed in that direction like why would you want to ever work for somebody else I mean if, if I if I had to work for someone else I might as well commit a crime and go to jail for me it would be like going to jail every day I hear you what is the best business advice that you ever received? Well, all of my business advice came from my mother, who never worked a day in her life, so knew nothing about business. But what she had is enormous common sense, and she raised 10 kids on a shoestring budget and was the most organized, motivating person you will ever meet. And the, I guess, well, it's got so many. My God, I wrote a book on everything on her. All right, but having to do a specific to business and marketing, because that was my forte, still is marketing. I would say when she told me when I was whining about that job at the Fort Lee Diner, and because I was competing with the blonde bombshell at the next counter who used to balance two coffee cups in each hand and two more in each of her breasts. That's how big her, her <laughs> chest was. It was like a shoebox glory with the blonde buzz hair. Up a, she looked like Dolly Parton. Just picture Dolly Parton when I say that. But anyway, uh, I got off course. When I was whining to my mother about it being unfair that nobody was sitting at my counter, there was only two counters and she was getting all the tips, my mother suggested I braid my hair. She said, if you don't have big, how did she put it? If you don't have big breasts, why don't you put ribbons on your pigtails or, or on your braids or something. And I braided my hair and put red ribbons and that's what got Ramon Simone to sit at my counter. That was the best advice because if I hadn't met him that night, he may not have given me a ride home. He may not have given me the thousand dollars to start my business. And where the heck was I going to get a thousand dollars? Okay. So that was great marketing advice. Play up what you got and forget about what you don't have. And I think I've used that successfully with all of my entrepreneurs. And of course, with my own business, trying to make the most of what I got there, you know, with a marketing gimmick, like a great example, by the way, is my pork bower barbecue guys. You should interview those guys, by the way, the guy, he's a dead ringer for a pig. I mean, an adorable pig, but he looks just like a pig. What a marketing advantage. So he uses that. You know, he walks into a meeting, sells the big stores, and he's just staring at him. They're all thinking the same thing. Doesn't he look like a pig? Okay. But it's a great thing. He doesn't mind. He's selling a ton of barbecue sauce, almost a million dollars this year. Well, didn't you call him out too and say, you have to dress up as a pig? I made it part of the deal. And you know why I made it part of the deal on Shark Tank? Because why would I want to get into bed with an entrepreneur who had such an obvious marketing advantage and maybe was afraid to use it? But he said yes. And that for me was a deal sweetener. It's kind of like that guy who used to sell chickens years ago who looked just like a chicken. What an advantage. He had none of the other chicken. Oh, Purdue, the biggest brand in chickens. You think that had something to do with Frank Purdue looking like a chicken? Absolutely. It sure did. Okay. So, yeah, no, I love Heath. Heath Hall, you got to interview him. But don't tell him he looks like a pig. He's getting tired of hearing it. I absolutely will not, Barbara. Okay. <laughs> what do you regret doing or not doing at some point in your journey? And what lesson did you learn from that? Um, I would say the only regret 
because it took me far long, too long to do it. I don't know what my excuse was. I don't think I had an excuse. Was when my boyfriend uh, left me, my boyfriend and business partner, Ramon Simone, with accents on both names, uh, <laughs> left me and uh, married my secretary. I just couldn't believe it. You know, I was raising his three kids. I thought we were the item. You know, we had been together seven years, I guess. Yeah. Seven year itch, proving that theory. But um, when he left to marry Tina, um, I stayed in the business. Uh, he was a 51% partner. He told me I couldn't fire Tina. He was a control partner. He was right. But it was a heartbreaker for me to work every day with who used to be my secretary. Now she's Mrs. Simone. And I felt, I felt ashamed of myself. You know, uh, you know, the, you know, rejection's not an easy thing in love, in love and in business all at once, right? But I stayed with that for over a year and accepted that situation until one day I walked in and said, we're ending this business and let me tell you how we're going to do it. And we divided it up just like a football draw. You know, he picked the best salesperson, I picked the next. So it was fair, you know. I moved out, he stayed. But um, I'm embarrassed that I took so long to wake up on that one. I should have said, no, not acceptable. But you know, I didn't have the confidence. He had found me in my little town. He had discovered me. He had told me I was smart. He had given me the thousand dollars. So a lot of my confidence wrote on that card. So that's my excuse, but not an excuse, really, because I should have just said, oh, really? I'm out of here, baby. But I didn't know the salespeople would follow me. I didn't know I had the power I had. You tend to undermine that if you're self-effacing. And it can be very dangerous if you let it get in your way of making change. And sadly for me, I was a, a slow changer on that one. It should not have been. Powerful. Barbara, besides the two phenomenal entrepreneurs you've mentioned, which entrepreneur that you've invested in excites you most right now? Well, this is, you're going to broadcast this somewhere. This is like uh, asking a mother who her favorite child is. And they are my, like my children. <laughs> I don't want to tell you. Um, so I, why don't I add to your list <laughs> so I won't get in trouble? Perfect. I love any entrepreneur who has the energy, desire, uh, and desires can be fleeting. You know, could have passion for a business today. It's meaningless if it doesn't last six years from now when going gets tough, right? But I have Daisy Cakes, amazing human being terrific, terrific promoter. She opens her mouth and the cameras click. She sells more Daisy Cakes online than anybody, well, Daisy Cakes, cake spirit online than anybody. She's over a million dollars in sales in a year and a half. That's pretty remarkable. Wow. She deserves a success. I have to say I adore and admire Ava the Elephant, Tiffany Crummins, who is the inventor of Ava the Elephant, because as a medicine dispenser, she invented to make kids who had AIDS take their medicine 17 times a day, right. 18 times a day, right? And I admire her because after she did that great do-good and should have been rewarded forever, she came down with cancer and pulled that business out from under a tent in a hospital room, which she was in bed for for 14 months, all right? Pretty amazing that somebody could do that, all right? So I have to love her really a lot, right? You have to love her Absolutely. and respect her, all right? And then I mentioned my barbecue guys. I have. I'm not supposed to talk about what I buy in the future. We're, see, we're already working with the entrepreneurs we bought that you don't know about yet on here. <laughs> erase, erase, erase that. I could lose my job over it. I will. It'll be erased. I'm marking Let it down. Let me tell right you, now. I also have a couple of clunkers that I invested in that just didn't have the stamina to stay the course. You know, it's not easy building a business, and they will remain nameless, but they also are on my red list with big red letters business losses. <laughs> <laughs> but that's and, a game, you know? And let's not forget about the Mainers. Oh, the Mainers, come on. Cousins Maine Lobster. Well, first of all, I wish I could be 30 years, maybe 30, 40 years younger. And I would definitely marry both those guys in a three-way wedding, without <laughs> a doubt. They are so adorable. Besides having their business acumen, they're so good looking. I can't even do a Skype call with their face up. It distracts me. Hey, they grow us right in Maine, Barbara. <laughs> they must. You're good. You know what? Actually, now I'm comparing your face to Sabin and Jim. I have to tell you, Sabin's better looking, but you're better looking than Jim. There you go. You're smack in the middle. Wow. One out of two ain't bad, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to change it up just a little bit here. If you could recommend one book to Fire Nation, what would it be? Um, for me, and I have to tell you, I honestly do not do a lot of reading, so you're probably asking the wrong person, but the one book I read probably every six to seven years, because it's so pure and simple and so powerful, I would say How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yes, Dale Carnegie. Is, you know, can I tell you, it doesn't get old somehow. It does not get old. It's such common sense, and it's all about people skills, and you know, with all the Harvard MBAs and that stuff running around, 
uh, that often don't have common sense and don't know sh- crap, I forgive my language, about running a business often. Uh, they know how to analyze and theorize, but they don't know how to do it. You know, big difference. I'm, I'm not saying unequivocally. I'm just saying what's great about that book is it really points to the fact it's all about the people. You know, business shouldn't have the name business because people think it has to do with business. It really has everything to do with people, how well you work with people, what kind of teams you build, how to get people on your side, how to persuade people, you know, uh, how to be really care about the quality because you don't want to disappoint your customer. It's all about the people. And that book is a great one about telling you how to influence people. And you're so right. It's so great to reread because that's a book you can't help but for the three months after you read that, you are going to act differently because you see how your actions are mirrored by the people you're talking to. Yeah. And you know what the second best book in the entire world is on business book after that one would have to be my book, Shark Tales. <laughs> I love it. It's going to be on the- I'm self-promoting. I don't know if it's the second best book, but that one I've read 500 times because I had to write the damn thing and edit it 5 million <laughs> times. Okay. But I do get phenomenal feedback. And if I was going to die and say, what did I really do well for life and for my, uh, to be proud of, I would say writing that book. I think- Honestly, I get more feedback on that than I do on Shark Tank because I think it touches people in a certain way. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to link that up in the show notes, front and center. Don't bother. I only make 50 cents a copy. It's not worth it. Oh, Just- you got to Amazon publish that. You make $7. Really? Then why don't go to Penguin Putnam? We'll talk. We'll talk. So Is that Barbara- true? That's upsetting me. Too <laughs> late on that advice. You get, you get 70% of every sale you make on Amazon publishing. That's why Tim Ferriss just came out with 4-Hour Chef solely on Amazon Publishing. He's selling it for $9.99 and he makes $6.99 on every sale. Well, guess what, honey? I love you now and I'm even going to lie and say you're better looking than Sabin and Jim put together. Because I love that idea and how is it I didn't know that? I don't know, Barbara. You need people like me in your life. I guess I do. We're going to move on to the last question of the interview. It's my favorite. It's kind of difficult. So take your time, digest, and then come back at Fire Nation with an amazing answer. Oh God, the pressure. Imagine you woke up tomorrow morning, Barbara, in a brand new world, identical to Earth, but you knew nobody. You still have all the experience and knowledge you currently have right now. Your food and Mm -hmm. shelter is taken care of, but all you have is a laptop and $500. What do you do in the next seven days? 500 bucks and a laptop and you don't know anyone. Well, I would work on the missing piece, which isn't the money. 500 is still 500. It isn't the, to the access, which would be the laptop. You have access. I would work on finding new people. I'd start a blog on anything. The sun setting, the sun rising. If the people, if I want to do real estate, I know that. If I want to do small business, I do that. I just start writing a blog with the sole purpose of trying to find followers. Now, that might not sound like a business plan, but once I had enough people reading my blog, then I'd figure out what to do that they would be willing to follow me on. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I kind of do it ass backwards, right? But if you have the people who are listening to you, it's really a, a question of filling in the blank. And then you also can talk back again, like, hey, what do you need help with? You're going to find probably an embarrassment of 12 different new businesses within that communication. But you're not going to find anything or even think of anything good if you don't have the people. And so, yeah, I would use definitely. And with the 500 bucks, I'd probably go out and buy myself a new outfit so I feel really nice. All right. And And so when I'm sitting around writing, I feel like I look the part like a cool (laughs) lady in a cool outfit, you know? Barbara, that is great actionable advice. And you've given us great actionable advice this entire interview, and we are all better for it. Give Fire Nation one parting piece of guidance, then share with us how we can connect with you, and then we'll say goodbye. Okay. The guidance is... If you're working your ass off or whatever you're trying to do, forget about it. It's no problem working like crazy. I'm a workaholic, no doubt, and I love it. I don't know why they call it work for me. But you should go to your calendar right now and cross out the days you're going on vacation, even if you have nowhere to go, even if you're sitting on a bump on a beach somewhere. (laughs) You should cross out the days for the whole year when you're going on vacation. I have gotten all of my business ideas outside the office, never at my desk, never. And it was always, I had the juice and the deliciousness of looking forward to those two days or four days and when I could afford it a week coming up 
two months out and almost enjoyed the vacation more before it even hit. But you got to be able to be good to yourself. I mean, one reason I think I've done well is I love myself. I mean, I'm not saying I'm, I don't think I'm conceited, but I take care of getting joy out of life and right. I put the joy first. And you know what? The business will fill up all the spaces, no doubt. Yeah. But you've got to put that ahead in your calendar now for the whole year. My, I vacation every fifth week like a clock. You can't find me. You can't reach me. You know why? Because I come back a better leader, better business person, better person, better mom, better wife. Well, not so much better wife. I'm hard to live with. But sure <laughs> that, better at everything else. And it makes a big difference, believe me. Barbara, how can we connect with you? Oh, um, well, what are you connecting for? You want a date or what's going on here? Well, I personally want a date, but <laughs> okay. I'm sure my listeners, they want to see you on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're on Facebook. We tweet all under my name, Barbara Corcoran, and it's Barbara at BarbaraCorcoran.com. Barbara, thank you for being so generous with your time. I know you don't like to play favorites, but I'm going to play a favorite. This is my <laughs> 123rd interview, 123. Wow. And you are my favorite interviewee. You know, John, I'm going to check your other tapes and see how many times you said that. I don't believe you. Zero times, Barbara. 123 <laughs> interviews, zero other times. You are my favorite. You better get better interviews then. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I'm secretly, but no longer secretly in love with you. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with Fire Nation. We salute you and we'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you, my John. Fire Nation, do you have a product or service that you would like to share with the 100,000 plus unique downloads a month Entrepreneur on Fire generates? Chris Brogan did. And when he sponsored an episode, he saw great results. If you'd like to have 15 seconds at the top of one of our shows to share your product or message, Go to www.sponsoreofire.com to find out more. Thank you for joining us at entrepreneuronfire.com, your daily dose of inspiration. Prepare to ignite.